Welcome back to The Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about managing former peers. Neil had been competing for a promotion and had gotten it at last. Sharing the news with me during one of our coaching sessions, he wasn't all that happy. Look what's about to happen, he said. He gave me a knowing look and said, Olga and Ashraf, I'm going to have to be their boss. They were hard enough to deal with when they were my peers. Olga had often come to Neil whispering about some conspiracy or other, trying to win him to her side. Neil saw her as self-serving and untrustworthy. Ashraf talked anywhere people would listen. He often made public statements that were inaccurate or inappropriate, resulting in much drama. Neil felt he should be reined in. I asked Neil, what's your biggest concern? He said, people are going to be upset. Not just Olga and Ashraf, there's Ron. He has to be pissed. I beat him out for the job. I'm sure there are others, too. I nodded in sympathy. And what's your biggest concern about people being upset? I just want to do the work, he said. And there's a lot of work to do. If everyone's upset, the work's going to go to hell. I know this place. When people are upset, productivity goes down. And what's your biggest concern about that, I asked. Well, how's it going to look? I step into the role and productivity goes down? I think it would look completely normal, I said. It's a big change. It's the J-curve. Things get worse before they get better. And people have feelings about it all. That's normal. Well, I don't want it to be my normal, he said. I want people to settle down and get to work. I shook my head. Neil, if people are upset, I think you have to deal with it. You know, if you don't, it's like you're some avoidant 1950s dad who says everything is fine when the house is actually burning down. You lose your credibility. If people have feelings and are upset, address it. He considered and then asked, like in a group? I shrugged. Maybe. What would that sound like? With humility, as if addressing people, he said, Look, I get that you might be upset, and I'm happy to talk to you about it, but let's get the work done, too. I nodded. How do you think that sounds? Well, not bad, he said. What do you think? I said, I agree. The basic message is not bad. It has an and baked into it. It's okay to be upset, and let's also do the work. You know, that's helpful. So if people are upset, do you think they'll actually come and talk to you? He took a big breath in and smiled at me. Those conversations are not my strong suit, you know that. If they do want to talk, what should I remember? I spoke slowly and ticked on my fingers. Be curious, not defensive. Ask open-ended questions about their feelings. Ask what they want you to do and then tell them what you're willing to do. He gave a snort. You make it sound easy. Well, it might not be easy, but it is learnable. I learned it. It just takes practice. Be curious, let them tell their story, then ask what they want you to do. He added, and then negotiate. Well, yeah, for sure. After a moment, I asked him, what about Olga and Ashraf and Ron? What about them? They're your former peers. Will you... Just talk to them as part of a group and leave it at that? Oh, I don't think so, he said. I think I need to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And say what, I asked. He looked up and thought. After a moment, he said, Well, I guess there's some things I want them all to hear, ideas I have about leading the group, and there's some things I have to say that are specific to each of them. He rolled his eyes. Ugh, this is going to be so awkward. Why? because I'm suddenly going to be responsible for their performance. I'm going to have to give them feedback. That's going to be awkward. What in particular? Well, take Ashraf. You know, he should have had a muzzle put on him a long time ago, but no one ever did it. If I don't step up to the plate and hold him accountable for shooting off his mouth, I'm going to feel like a big hypocrite. But I have no idea if he will take that sort of feedback from me. The same with Olga. The same how, I asked. I don't like how she plays on the team. I want her to start putting the team's needs first, but, you know, I can't imagine her ever changing. Well, suppose it's a year from now, I said. 
You've been managing them all that time, and neither one of them has changed the way you want. What'll happen? He said, uh, I guess it'll become part of their performance review. I nodded as if to say it sounds reasonable, and then I asked, would that be okay with you? Well, to repeat myself, awkward. I asked, can I challenge you on that? On feeling awkward? Yeah. I said, look, I understand why you would feel awkward if you were still their peer. And then I laughed and said, it makes me think of when my older brother would babysit us. You know, he could say whatever he wanted, but it didn't really matter. He was not the parent. We were not going to listen to him. But, you know, it's not like that with you, Neil. You're not their peer anymore. You competed for this role, and the organization has proclaimed that you are the most deserving. You deserve to be managing Olga and Ashraf and Ron. What's awkward about deserving to be the boss? He looked at me and said, I guess it'll be awkward until I really feel deserving. I have to give myself permission to be the boss. I said nothing. That felt like a momentous learning. After a long reflection, he said, I guess there are two things I want to be sure to remember. The first one is clarity. You know, a year from now, I want us all to be doing our work differently, but that's not going to happen unless I am really clear about my vision. Clarity about the work is going to be crucial. Oh, good for you, Neil. And can I throw in another idea relating to clarity? Sure, he said. I think it's also important you be clear about why you're changing the work. Why are you doing this? What's the bigger picture? Tell them the why a thousand times. He nodded and picked up his pen and wrote, and hey, that's helpful. So I want to have clarity about the work itself. He underlined his note. And clarity about why the work is important. He wrote and underlined again. And then he wrapped his pen. You know what else I want to be clear about? What? I want to be clear about how I'm going to measure their performance. He wrote and drew another line. I have to be clear with my feedback. That won't be awkward, I said with a grin. He smiled back. Not if I feel deserving. Excellent, I said. And then I asked, you said there were two things you wanted to remember. Clarity was the first one. What was the other? He twirled his pen. And my older sister used to babysit us, and most of the time, it was fine. But every now and then, she just wasn't fair. It was infuriating. She would bully us just because she had the power. So if these positions were reversed, like if Ron had gotten the job, I think that's what I'd be worried about. Is he going to be fair? Is he going to abuse his power now that he's got it? So that's the second thing. Along with clarity, I want to be fair. I don't want him to think I'm flexing my muscle just because I can. How will you prove you're being fair, I asked. Isn't fair subjective from one person to the next? I think fairness proves itself over time. Consistency is what makes something fair or not fair, right? Consistency. And whether it's appropriate for the situation, the pattern emerges over time. Hmm. Can you tolerate it if people are upset all that time, I asked? How do you mean? Well, if people are upset now, and if it takes some time to figure out that you are or are not fair, you know, they could be upset for quite a while. Could you tolerate that? Well, it won't be fun, but nothing lasts forever, right? That is true. Feelings change, I said. Which reminds me, he said, of something else you and I have talked about. What's that? Not taking things personally. You know, if I'm really deserving of this role, and I think I am, and if they are upset about that, that's actually about them. That's where they are in their development. And it's not like everyone's going to be upset, right? I'm sure they're going to be cheerleaders too, people who are going to celebrate when my promotion is, gets announced. I mean, so the people who are upset, it's not about me. He saw me smile and asked, what? I said, well, you know, if it's not about you when people are upset, then it's also not about you when they celebrate. He laughed heartily. Touché. Neil and I stayed in touch after the coaching ended. Dealing with people's feelings, plus being clear and fair, helped him personify the look and sound of leadership. This is such an interesting situation. 
Have you ever lived through this, where someone who was a peer yesterday is the boss tomorrow? You know, I've heard about it going well, where it was really a terrific success, but I have also heard some real horror stories. I mean, really, stories that could be like an expose in psychology today. If you've witnessed this, I just wonder which side of that continuum you're on. You know, the truth is that this situation is so unique, you could go your whole career and never have it happen. But even so, I think the three core concepts in this episode are worth learning as a leader, whether this is specific to your situation or not. So what are the three core concepts? In reverse order, be fair. Recognize you have biases. Biases affect your thinking. I was just leading a team, a video learning session about influence, and we were talking about how our biases make us unfair. You have preferences. Your preferences change your feelings about people. And when you have feelings about people, but which by the way is normal, you should have feelings about people, your feelings can make you not fair, negatively or positively. Pay attention. Examine your motives. Be the leader you want to be led by. Be fair. The second core concept, clarity. Clarity. If you're a long-time listener, I just hope the word clarity resonates with you. I talk about clarity in so many ways. You cannot have the look and sound of leadership without clarity. I put the word clarity into the search field in our archive of tips and up-popped episodes like communicating with clarity, creating clarity, driving your message home, and of course the granddaddy of clarity, sorting and labeling. You simply cannot succeed leading people if you aren't clear. Be clear about how you measure the work. Be clear about your expectations. Be clear with your information. Be clear with your feedback. You know, if you're managing others, oh my goodness, there are a million ways you can be not clear. You could think about clarity all day long, and there would still be more to think about. There is no finish line when it comes to clarity. So be clear. (laughs) Good luck. Before I finish up with the third concept, five quick things. Yes, five quick things. First, if you are a coach, and I know that many of you are, and it's great to be in touch with you, I just recorded a great episode of a show called Coach the Coach on Business X Radio. If you're listening in real time, the link is on the Essential Communications homepage. If it's not there, you can find it in the media section, which is under you and us. Give it a listen. It was great. Second, The whole idea for this episode came from a conversation I had with Dave Stahoviak on his wonderful podcast, Coaching for Leaders. It was his episode 257, How to Manage Former Peers. There are many ideas in that episode that are not in this. It's a good episode. Give it a listen. 257, Coaching for Leaders. And if I recall correctly, the whole topic was Dave's idea. So thanks a million, Dave. It's always a pleasure. And speaking of Dave, here's item number three. I got to record an episode of Dave's show with my dear friend, Dr. Lois Frankel. I've known Lois almost 30 years now. Lois is the person who taught me how to coach. And boy, did she teach me how to coach women. Lois has been in my life in all kinds of ways. At different times, she has transformed the lives of each one of my daughters. Lois is fantastic. She has been addressing the issue of gender in the workplace since long before I met her. So Lois and I just recorded an episode of Coaching for Leaders called Why Men Are Heard and Women Are Liked. It's Dave's episode 392. You know, if you've never heard Lois, give her a listen. She has thought so deeply about gender in the workplace for so long. She is articulate and funny and smart. And you you don't have to agree with Lois. In fact, she loves it when people disagree with her. But she's always great to listen to. So that's number three, Coaching for Leaders, episode 392. Here's number four, a quick reminder, Mindy Dana is coming back on the show. We're going to read your questions on the show. We're going to give you some coaching. So send us your questions, your problems, your situations. We would love to help. And finally, number five, my gratitude. Thank you for the amazing, affirming, gratifying stories that you tell me in your emails. I usually hear these stories when people subscribe to the HTML version of the podcast. I realize I haven't talked about this in a long time. I don't know if you know it's a thing. There is essentially a transcript every month. You can subscribe to it on the Essential Communications website, 
There's a button on every page that says subscribe. It's EssentialCom.com. EssentialCom with two M's, dot com. And you'll also find all the episodes there, but stop. I'm in a rabbit hole. What I wanted to talk about was gratitude. I wanted to express my gratitude to the people this month who took the time to express their thanks in the iTunes store. This month, reviews were written by Yvonne Solis from the UK, from Canada, Beezer Boy, and MacGyver's Love Child. And then from the US, Abby Liv, Kimber BTX, Caitlin Segal, 2013. Thanks. Those reviews mean the world to this podcast. You know, I don't know if you know, but we have a, an amazingly high ranking in the iTunes store, even though we are not one of the big boys. And part of what keeps that ranking up is you taking a minute or two to post a review. So thanks. And that was number five. So we get back to the three core concepts in this episode. I had talked about fairness. I have talked about clarity. And now here comes number three. Address the emotions. People get upset anytime anything changes, right? But this time they're going to be upset about you. And it's yours to deal with. So deal with it. Don't avoid it. And I know this is not most people's favorite thing to do at work. I get it. I know. I talk with people about this all the time. I know. But as I said during the episode to Neil, you can learn these skills. There are a slew of episodes about it. I went to the search field in the archive and I put in the word emotion and up popped episodes like combating emotional hijacks, building emotional intelligence, and dealing with emotional responses. Or you can learn it from two great books. One, Difficult Conversations by the folks at the Harvard Negotiation Project, Stone, Patton, and Heen, or the second book, Crucial Conversations. You know, I bet a lot of you have Crucial Conversations on your bookshelf already. Take it down, read it, pick one or two of the skills and begin to use them. It works. I use a ton of skills that I read in that book. I'll just name two. State your intention. I use that all the time. And humility and confidence. I talked about humility and confidence in last month's episode about executive presence, and I mentioned Crucial Conversations. It's a helpful book. And actually, by the way, I like the other book better, Difficult Conversations. Either way, they're both great. That's it for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening.